Today is an extraordinary day for Edward Sahakian, for his family, myself included, and I would like to think the wider cigar community who over the last 40 years have had the opportunity and I hope the pleasure of seeing and visiting and enjoying Edward's unique company and wonderful brand of cigar merchant. On the 29th of May, 1980, Dad, you managed to open what would have been a very, very uh, adventurous new shop in London at the time. It was, of course, Davidoff of London. We are now exactly 40 years to the day later. I don't think in your wildest dreams you would have imagined uh, you would be sitting here discussing your 40 year anniversary of the shop. But of course, due to the extraordinary circumstances happening in the world at the moment, uh, we are not able to share this event as a party in the personal and uh, usual way we would like to celebrate something. So it's been my unique opportunity to get my father to sit down and answer some questions I've always wanted to ask him about the shop and about those early days. Now, Dad, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with, with a few questions that you absolutely have to answer because they come from the sweetest, dearest parts of your heart your grandchildren. They have put forward a few questions, which I will start with. Hello. Dad, if I may, I'm going to start with the first one, which comes from Apolline and Allegra in Valencia, all the way there. And it starts, Grandpa, if you didn't choose London to set up Davidoff, in which other city would you have opened the shop? Uh, I'll come back in 10 years time and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Uh, it would have been a city where I would have been living at the time, but not necessarily with the cigar shop. Where would have I wanted it to be? I would still want it to be here. London. In London? I love it. That's the reason we came here. That's the reason I took refuge here. You settled down. You were all young and small. You were at the age of the grandchildren now. And uh, no, London, definitely London again. Okay, well, that's a very good answer. Next one again from Apolline and Allegra in Valencia. How did you know you had the right idea for opening Davidoff in London? I didn't. I didn't have a clue. It was just a passion. It was just a thought. It was a dream. Uh, it, it was never really planned that I would open a shop and uh, run it. But it, a course of events just pushed me into that direction. My lunch with William, as you know the story, uh, just to say thank you for his advice on my immigration affairs. Uh, the consequence of that lunch was his question of what are you going to do if you're not going back. Next thing I know, I'm telling him about our dreams over a glass of, well, it was more than a glass of wine, it was a bottle of wine and some brandy on top of it. And started talking about dreams and I said, well, of course, you know, I'd love to have a, maybe a camera shop or a cigar shop actually a cigar shop, like the Davidoff shop in Geneva. And he started writing letters to them, telling me he's not going to charge me anything, don't worry, it's just the inquiry. And next thing I know, we're talking to the president of Davidoff. And next thing I know, I'm purchasing a location. And there on, as they say, it's all history. I started talking to the Davidoff president in February, late February 1979 and May 1980, 29th of May 1980, 
we're opening the shop. It all happened so quick that I never had time to stop and think or even think twice. Well, Am I doing the right thing or not? May, may I say that I have a few more questions that will come close to what you're talking about now. Okay. So Should can we save so those on. goodies for, <laughs> for the next question? I have now a question from your granddaughter Stella here in London. Was Grandpa excited or nervous when he first opened the shop? Grandpa was excited and nervous. Excited. It was a totally new venture in my life. And of course, worried. Am I doing the right thing? Will it be successful? How successful? Will I be able to cope with it? Will I be able to run it, manage it? I've never done such a thing before in my life. And uh, it was both. Bella and it was both. But when you like something, you have to take the risk and jump into it. Well, that's wonderful advice for all of us. And this is the last question from your grandchildren. This comes from Elvis in London. And he asked, Grandpa, what did you feel at the end of your first day at the shop? It was very exciting, Elvis. It was exciting. It was like opening the door into a whole world of mysteries. It was like walk, stepping into the secret garden. Every corner, every moment, every second of it, there was something new happening, new experience, new people, new faces. Uh, when we arrived here, we didn't have too many friends, very few. And from the first day on in the shop, every day I was meeting new people, nice people. Some of them maybe not very nice, but it was a whole new experience. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you very much. Now a few questions that I've thought about, and, and I'm sure I will miss a few along the way. Well, before you do that, I'm going to drink a toast to my grandchildren, oh. to all four of them. To Apolline, Allegra, Elvis, Stella, to all four of my little darlings. May I accept a toast on their behalf? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Mm. Mm. Delicious champagne. Lovely. Okay. What next? So, you decided in 1979 to open a luxury cigar merchant in London. Now, the world was a very different place at that time. Um, the UK was reeling from multiple crises that had gone through in the mm. 1970s. I think it was fair to say the idea of luxury and affluence uh, was not a comfortable one in, in London in 1980 or 1979. And of course, the, the market in London and, and the wider community of the UK, uh, and especially in St. James's where you opened the shop, it was full of tobacconists, famous cigar shops, long-standing tobacconists. I think it's fair to say most people would have thought you were mad. What did you see that they missed? Well, first, when I was opening the shop, at the time I, I did a rough calculation. I counted 12 shops within two mile radius, exactly in that corner of London. There were some very famous shops, old shops, from Dunhill, Robert Lewis, Lambert and Butler, Benson and Hedges, I mean, we were surrounded by shops. Uh, however, uh, none of them really had the facilities of the modern way of looking after cigars. I've been to the Davidoff shop many times. I started going my first visit to the Davidoff shop, I think it was 1972, 73. And the concept there was keeping cigars in a separate area, as we call it, the walk-in humidor now. The temperature was controlled, but none of that existed in London. And the idea was to keeping the cigars in a natural environment. And to me, it was important that cigars, especially for keeping them, it should be kept to a certain extent in a humidified area. It had to be cool. Uh, it had to be modern, chic, nice looking, tempting, tempting to walk in. 
Uh, but that wasn't the reason I opened the shop. Uh, I opened the shop because I, I needed something to do. I was here, I didn't have any work. Uh, if you remember, one day our neighbor, Kevin's father, Tony, asked you, what does your father do? It was early months when we had just moved here. I hadn't even gone after the shop and you told them you thought about it. And you said, my father, he does shopping. <laughs> and then when I met Tony, he said, well, I asked your son and you said, uh, I said, what's your business? And he said, oh, my father does shopping. I said, well, he's right because you just moved in here. So there's a lot of things to buy, fill in a new house. But I'm thinking of opening a shop. So, ah, I thought so, because doing shopping all your life is not going to be <laughs> on, will it? <laughs> well, you, no. can, you can say you were doing market research. <laughs> so that I needed to do something. And uh, with William's advice, he said, why don't you do something that you enjoy? Matter of fact, he asked me, he said, uh, what do you enjoy? What are your hobbies? Maybe you could do something with your hobbies. And of course, enjoyment and hobby put together becomes cigar smoking for me. I said, well, why not a Davidoff shop? There is no Davidoff shop in London, especially with the new concept. Dad, may I ask, did you think there was a customer in London who would appreciate and want to spend more money than normal on the best, best, best cigars no. in the world? Or what, what, how did you think about it? Did you do any market research? I, I just took it for granted. If I go to the Davidoff shop in Geneva and buy my cigars, if there's a Davidoff shop in London, people will come to London and buy their cigars. And you're, you're not the only one, so other people would do and what you're doing? other ones. Okay. Uh, of course, the back of my mind, the thought was, I found a nice location of the shop, so that sh location is worth something for always. And I will be selling a product which is a cigar, which people hopefully will buy. But even if they don't, what is the worst that could happen? I'll have enough cigars for the rest of my life to sit and smoke. So it wasn't the biggest gamble of my life. <laughs> That's a very nice way to put it. Um, if I may, I'll move on to, to my next question. Um, who gave you the best advice before you opened the shop and what was it? Oh God. You know, when, when you're starting a business, everybody gives you advice. Uh, which one did it stand out? Probably the, the one that really stands out more was a friend of mine said, Edward, whatever you do, enjoy what you're doing. If you enjoy what you're doing and be there, you will succeed. And uh, it's, it's proved to be 100% true. I think the, the part of the success of the shop was that I was there. That was one of our terms of the agreement with Davidoff that I should be in the shop, Dr. Schneider. That was the first condition he put there. He said, I will give you the franchise, but you have to be in the shop. And of course, being in the shop, I enjoyed what I was doing. How could you not enjoy being in a cigar shop if you're a cigar smoker? <laughs> so I think that was the best advice I got. Wonderful. Well, coming to those early days before you opened the shop, um, do you remember who was involved in the, in the construction, the setup, and of course, the design uh, of the shop, which has stood the test of time? It's so elegant. Who was behind that? Well, the location of the shop itself, I have to say I found the location. I wanted that. Not that I found it, it was there. I wanted that location. At the time, it was an empty space. As you know, it belonged to the Algerian tourist office. I asked my solicitor then, dear friend now, William Hurt, to see if he could get it. And with William, he was the one who actually pursued the Davidoff franchise. And then he said, leave it with me. And about six months later, he said, we bought it. So that was the location. Then there were people involved in it. The main one was the architect, Albena Robson, uh, Anthony Robson's uh, wife. Uh, very nice lady. It's not easy to get along with architects, but we somehow got along quite well. And the first set of designs she had done was completely not to my liking. And I explained to her why. And she said, let me draw another design for you. 
and within a week she came up with another design which is the current design as it is which was beautiful perfect so it was albina we still see each other we still kept in touch and then uh, there were some contractors furnishing the shop but the main uh, furniture of the shop all the cabinets the walk-in humidors all the shelving everything came from switzerland with the introduction of davidov mm -hmm. from basel and they made all the components drove it in three lorries down to london with three or four technicians and within a long weekend about three and a half four days time everything was set up and ready and functioning and this would have been almost at the end of the preparation process? Uh, this was, uh, yes, it, it was like March, Marchish, okay. March, April, March, April, 1978, uh, 1980, 1980. Yeah. Uh, I'm pleased you asked, you mentioned the date there, Doug, because I have a, a, a question about a rumor, which I believe is true, that, uh, Nicholas Freeman, who ran, of course, the most important importer of, of Cuban cigars and indeed the Davidoff importation as well um, at the time, uh, you made a bet with him that the shop would be ready to open by Christmas 1979. Is that true? That's yeah, absolutely true. I remember that. Later. What happened? That was very well because in early, after February 1979, uh, when we had a couple of meetings with Davidoff and then Dr. Schneider came over and said, we have to also uh, talk and introduce you to our agents in London because there was a company called Hunters and Franco, which still exists, thankfully, but they had a subsidiary by the name of Anglo Havana Cigars. Anglo Havana Cigars was created by Nicholas Freeman purely to do the business of Davidoff. So they were the agents of Davidoff uh, cigars and Dr. Schneider came over and we met uh, it was probably sometime in May 1979 we had a couple of meetings it was David Baxter uh, and Mr. Nick Freeman himself and then he said what are you doing I said well I'm looking for a location and then I looked around first we had the location next to the current location which used to be the Ronson repair shop I immediately that was available and for sale so I immediately purchased that one and then my eye was on the current location on the corner of German Street and St. James's Street so uh, uh, with uh, mentioning it to William and him writing the letters to the Algerian embassy to the Algerian foreign ministry and finally to Algerian tourist office eventually he managed to get the uh, lease for me. It was September 1979. We had another meeting with Dr. Schneider and Nicholas Freeman, and I invited them to come. Actually, I had the keys by then. I said, I'd like to show you the location. So we walked in there. Everybody had to look around. Dr. Schneider said, this is a good location. It needs work to be done. I said, absolutely. And that's where you will help me, I hope. And uh, Nick turned around and said, and when do you intend to open the shop? I said, well, it's September. I think by Christmas will be open. He looked at me and said, Edward, you know, this is England. Things don't happen that fast. It's impossible you'll have it ready by Christmas. I said, Nick, it was September, October, November, December, three months. I will have it open. So I bet you, you can't. I said, yeah, I'll take the bet case of champagne so we shook hands there and this was only perhaps my third or fourth meeting with them we, we were never really had separate meetings as such and then of course as we progressed with the architects the designs uh, the contractors uh, end of the day it was like end of November we signed all these agreements everything and the new start date the start of the work in the shop was going to be or was 2nd of December 1980 so I knew there's no way we will be opening in December so one day I called Nick I said uh, Nick uh, 
you know we have a bed I said yes I said you know the shop will be ready for Christmas in a month or three weeks time I said yes it was actually a day or two before Christmas I said well would you like to come and see the shop he thought about it, said yes when tomorrow morning 10 o'clock we're like 22nd 23rd of uh, December 1979 10 o'clock in the morning we met outside the Franco's good old Franco's we had a coffee there and then it, we walked across the street I opened the side door we walked in nothing everything is as it was where the old tenants had left he looked around but right there in the center of the shop I had put a empty crate on the crate there was this big box with a huge big red ribbon on it and he looked at me surprised he said Nick I lost this bet and this is the case of champagne let me put it into your car <laughs> I think that gesture sort of broke the ice it was a lovely case of Dom Perignon champagne and he said well we will drink the first bottle together I said done Wonderful. And that was a bet that I happily lost because it created a very close friendship with Nick Freeman. And that friendship stayed on, became even closer, and our relation got better and better. I learned so much from him, thanks to him. We had a lovely guest list as well. And now I have the pleasure of uh, working with his daughter, lovely Gemma. You know, she's a little girl your age. And now she's running the company. She's the chairman of Hunters and Franco. And here we are. A generation later, we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I knew it was true. Uh, moving on to the next question. Who was at the shop from Davidoff headquarters on the opening day? Oh, God. On the opening day, well, we had, as you know, 500 guests. But uh, who came from the Davidoff side. It was Zeno Davidoff and his wife, Dr. Schneider and his wife, Raymond Schura. As you know, Dr. Schneider is no longer with us. Uh, Zeno and his wife are no longer with us. Neither is Dr. Schneider's wife. But Raymond is still around. I spoke to him just this morning he was at home. He has just survived a, a very close disaster. He had was a coronavirus, but they managed to uh, cure him. And he's back home. He's in good health. He sends his regards. There was also uh, Nick Freeman representing the Anglo Havana cigars, of course. David Baxter and a whole lot of uh, guests a lot of guests a lot of people i didn't know a lot of people i only met once in these 40 years but also many many people that we met as strangers and turned out to be some dear friends one of them that always stays in my mind is of course desmond Souter. Uh, i think uh, simon chase was there although he was not involved with the davidoff side of it uh, but with, uh, definitely with Desmond Souter and Pamela, it, it was the uh, first time we shook hands at the reception and from there on became very close friends. Um, is it true that uh, Raymond Shura very kindly agreed uh, un unexpectedly to stay in London for a further couple of weeks to help you run the shop? Well, where Raymond was here two weeks before opening the shop, helping me out with everything, uh, from setting up everything, the display of items, because I'd never done that business before. So he was there, and he could see nearer. I was getting to the opening date. I was really getting more stressed. And part of my stress was, you know, he's going to leave the day after tomorrow. The shop opened, I think it was on a Thursday. On the 29th was a Thursday. And then we were going to be open Friday, Saturday, close for Sunday, then reopen again on the Monday. And Desmond was, uh, Desmond, <laughs> Raymond was supposed to leave London on the Saturday morning. 
And then it was just a day or two before the opening. He could see how stressed I was getting. He said, Edward, would you like me to stay another two weeks with you? I said, Raymond, that would be God sent. I was too embarrassed to ask you, but if you can, that would be fantastic. You, you would be a savior. And he did. And he altogether, he stayed a whole month in London. And he really got me going. And not only me, I think if you speak to anybody or many people who are involved in tobacco business, they all remember Raymond and the way he was always helpful. He, he was a great, great, great asset, still is, and a dear friend. Oh, what a beautiful gesture. That, that's mm -hmm. unique. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Um, this sort of brings me to, to another question related to your, to your opening. Uh, and I think we've probably touched on it from your grandchildren. But my question was, what was going through your mind the day before you opened the shop on 29th of May, 1980? Excitement, anxiety, worries. What am I doing? Am I reopening the shop? Am I doing the right thing? Will I be able to cope with it? Will I be able to run it? Because I've never run a shop. I've been to many shops before that, always on the other side of the counter, buying things, never selling it. And that, that was uh, all mixed uh, feelings. But of course, don't forget, your mom was always there. She was encouraging me all the time. She used to calm me down. She used to encourage me and saying, oh, don't worry, you'll do it, you'll do it, don't worry, I know you will do it. And of course, that kept me going. Well, in interestingly enough, that's a couple of questions later, but seeing as you mentioned, Mama, I'd like to, to jump to that question. What did Mum think about you opening a cigar shop, firstly? And the second part of the question, is it true that she's helped to define your wonderful sartorial style? Well, mom, I think she was very happy that I was starting a business. I think she was also happy I would be sitting home all day long or going out doing shopping and bringing more things back home. <laughs> but no, genuinely, she was very happy that I was going to do something. And when she met uh, Dr. Schneider and Zeno, she felt that uh, I've been getting involved with a very nice not only business, but a nice family. The Davidoff family was a lovely family. It was a very close family. We got very close to both Zeno and his wife and Dr. Schneider and his wife. He would invite us for weekends. Uh, so no, mom was very happy and she, it was part of the reason I was able to start the shop was because of her encouragement. Uh, your other question, yes, that's absolutely true. There have been times when even up to now, she will make me go back and change my shirt in the morning because it doesn't suit the suit I'm wearing. Uh, you probably heard the story that she's even once or twice taken my shoes, new shoes that I had purchased, taken them back and changed them because she didn't like the color. <laughs> so here you are with mom, <laughs> but that's mom, you know that. <laughs> well, you're lucky that uh, we're both lucky. We have wives of impeccable taste. Yeah. And uh, when you have someone like that supporting you, behind you, yeah, encouraging you, it's very difficult to fall. If you will be happy with Jacqueline as much as happy I've been with Greta, then you have no problems oh. whatsoever. Oh, thank you. So who was your first customer? Do you remember? Yes. I remember very well. When I was opening the shop for the last month, so the whole of May, we had blocked off the beautiful glass windows on German Street and St. James's Street, completely with pieces of paper. But about two weeks before the opening, I used to do a bit of a teaser. So I started tearing a little bit of the brown paper off. <laughs> and then the first or second day where I tore a bit of it off, I could see a pair of eyes in the morning so I used to go out and see this short gentleman, not shaved, differently dressed. He wasn't in a suit and a tie, but very chic, but differently dressed. And he's coming and he's trying to see through that little hole what's happening in the shop. A few days later, there was another gentleman there. And he's trying to look through the holes to see what's happening. So every day I opened a bit more and a bit more. And this went on until the 29th, uh, 
where we took off all the paper and everything. And I could see them hovering outside, but the doors were locked because we didn't open the shop to the public on the 29th. It was only Zeno when he arrived on Thursday afternoon. Uh, he was there, Raymond, Dr. Schneider, everybody was there. Some friends were there and he actually cut the ribbon and walked in, but the doors did not open for the public. For the public, it was open from the next morning, from the Friday morning. Friday morning, the doors of the shop opened. Both of those gentlemen, one after another, I can't remember which one came first and which one the other, they both walked in. The first one was a gentleman called Joseph, Joseph at 2D. Uh, he had a series of shops. Of course, wonderful, uh, yes. Lovely man, what a lovely man. And the other one uh, is a dear friend now, uh, Rajaji, Rajaji Rawat who was at the time living in London and uh, he walked in and he started looking around and he was cigars, I'm wondering you know, why is he looking around, is he from another shop, competition or whatever. Then eventually we started chatting and talking and then he went out, came back two hours later, again we started chatting and then went back and f for a few weeks we used to see him three, four times a day and he would buy like one or two cigars and smoke and go out. And then we, as we started talking more and more, uh, we both opened up, well, he opened up even more and we started chatting and one day he invited me, he said, we were talking about espresso. He said, I make the best espressos. The espresso here, Franco's, is not as good as the ones I make. He said, why don't you come to my house and let's, I'll make you a nice espresso. I said, well, where do you live? Said, oh, right here, Arlington House. He said, okay. Let's go now. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. So we walked across to his flat there, lovely flat overlooking the park. And he had these one of these uh, coffee machines, which he grinded to coffee beans and then filled it and threw this machine, made the espresso, and it was a delicious espresso. It was so nice. I complimented on him about that. And of course, three days later, he walked into the shop with a huge box. He said, I bought you one of these machines so you could make yours. Now, if I remember, it was a Gaggia machine. It was uh, a Gaggia, uh, exactly, yes. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, when, in those early days, before or just after you opened, was there a retailer from another business or another shop that you particularly admired or respected or had observed and want and sort of learned from, or was it all your own personality? Retailer. I, my first encounter with Davido and Zeno was in Geneva. The first time I walked into the Geneva shop, the Davido Geneva shop, I was looked after and served by a gentleman, elderly gentleman, which afterwards at the counter, I found out that he's Mr. Davido. And some, I knew that he was the proprietor, but I didn't expect to see him there. And he, he took me right through with his attitude, the way he spoke to me, we met the first time, and treated me like an old friend. Try this, try that, keep it like that, don't forget to do that. And at then, as we're walking out of the shop, he said, wait, 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 he gave me a, lighter as well he said oh, keep this lighter in your pocket it's a present from me you will need it when you want to light your cigar and that attitude i really appreciated and uh, that that example i've never forgotten the amount of times somebody buys a cigar i always ask them have you got a light would you like a box of matches or a lighter or a cutter maybe and i think it makes it all the difference that was the best lesson that i learned from him but also when I, whenever I'm traveling or wherever I go into the shops, I always keep my eyes and ears open. I always watch uh, if somebody does something which I enjoy, like, I remember to do that as well. And if they show a negative attitude, if they do something which I don't like or get offended, I also remember that, make sure that I don't repeat that myself in the shop. It's wonderful, Dad. And uh, I think you found a kindred spirit, or Zeno found a kindred spirit in you. Uh, I see you doing that every day. Uh, I've seen you do that, and I've uh, learned a little bit from you, as you're happy to say. You I think you me. learned 
maybe a little bit from me, but the rest of it, you had it in you. Oh, you were very kind you, to say that. I'm not so sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, jumping to, to my next question. Um, when did the shop begin to, to, be, to become a success? When, when did you begin to feel, okay, actually, I've, I'm onto something good here? And did you need to change anything from how you had originally started running the business uh, for that to happen? Not really, no. I mean, the success of the shop, to be honest, it probably started from the next day. Uh, the Monday when I opened the shop, Although Zeno was there, Zeno stayed for two, three days, four days, I think, uh, for the opening of the shop. And part of it, that was the reason he would be in the shop and people would come just to meet him, shake hands with him, ask him to sign the book. And uh, sometimes I would say, Zeno, would you like to serve them? So I could see and learn even more. But the, the quality of the people and the quantity of the people that started coming, I was surprised it was a brand new shop. I didn't think we would get more than a handful of people at a time. And, you know, suddenly it would really get busy. People would come in one after another. My motto in the shop was, as it was uh, with Davidoff in Geneva, that we, we, ha we have opened a tobacco shop that has everything. Anything a smoker requires, needs, we have it. Being from a simple pack of wood buying cigarettes to pipes, to cigars, to humidors, accessories, uh, lighters, cutters, anything to do with smoking, we would make sure to have it. And I made sure that we did have it, but never run out of it. Wonderful. Um, my next question, did you always intend to keep cigar stock for long-term aging? And if so, when? And also, why did you start to do it? Well, part of it, you probably know why. I'm known to be a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> if I need something, if I need one thing, I buy two of it. Just in case the first one I lose breaks or doesn't work, I'll have a backup. Uh, two, uh, which was one of the main reasons as well, uh, in the early years of the shop, when I opened it, it was probably 83, 84, 85. There was a period where Cuba went through it. And when I say Cuba, at that time, all cigars came from Cuba for us. As you know, the Davidoff cigars, every other cigar that we had, 99% of them came from Cuba with one or two Honduran cigars, maybe. But that was nothing. Uh, and Cuba went through a period where they had uh, affected their uh, tobacco leaf, something called a blue mold. Mm. And that started affecting the leaves, started affecting uh, the harvest, and started affecting the quantity of cigars coming out of there. And there were shortages. There were all sorts of shortages. So every time I would order a cigar, I would sometimes get only half of it, sometimes even less. Uh, they were, we couldn't get enough David of cigars. We couldn't get David of uh, enough David of three thousands. We had customers who would go from shop to shop buying all the David of three thousands, and then after that, he started sending his plane to Geneva, to Paris, and uh, to Belgium. I think you know he would send his plane around with the secretary to buy all the David of three thousands. So that if he's buying it and keeping it, I should be doing the same as well. And uh, that, that was the real reason. So from 86, 87, 88, every time there was a consignment of cigars, I would just buy it. Mm. I didn't worry about if I didn't sell it, what will I do with it? If I couldn't sell it, I knew I, could, I would sell it next year. If I didn't sell it next year, I would sell it the year after that. But I also had an experience with keeping cigars in a humid condition. If you remember, you, you might not remember, you were a little boy, but in Tehran, uh, I didn't have humidors there, it didn't exist there, but uh, I used to buy these glass jars with the rubber seal on the top and I used to put my cigars vertically into them and a small humidifying unit on the top and seal it. Mm -hmm. And as time would go by, the cigars would get soft, ferment, mature and 
within a year or two the taste would even taste better mm -hmm. so i had that experience as well so here i thought well no reason we can't keep the cigars and of course it had to be kept cool which we uh, i installed the humidification uh, and the humidification i had from day one but the cooling system we, about two or three years later i installed there and i had the space for it so i just kept on buying cigars not every cigar but the cigars that i thought they are nice cigars there are cigars that is always in demand there are cigars that could only get better uh, my only wish was that i hope i could have had more david of cigars <laughs> and kept them forever but salabi <laughs> such is life well uh, your your hoarding and prudent approach then has been a, a boom and a boon to to countless cigar smokers today because we, we are still fortunate to welcome clients who want to enjoy older cigars and in vintage and rare and it's only because of your foresight that we can offer those to them so thank you very much for that Dan. Uh, mo moving on to to the next question it's, it's a tender question um, the team at Davidoff of London they're a wonderful blend of youth and experience um, who are your longest serving employees and when did they join, do you remember? Of course, I remember almost like yesterday. As you get older, you remember the older events better than today's events. <laughs> uh, the first one that still is with us is, of course, Judy. Judy joined the shop in November, I think it was 1st or 2nd of November, 1980. It was a few months after I opened the shop. And then after that is Paul. Paul joined again, first Monday, 1st or 2nd of June, 1981. And then after that, we have several. We have Anne, which has been with us for since 1988. Uh, and then you move towards the younger. Yes, yes. the rest there are sort of very younger ones. Uh, I still miss uh, the, the first year when we opened the shop, we had uh, Anne and Rickards with us, which she's no longer with us anymore. And we had several uh, lovely people who literally I mean, Anne, she was still working in the shop when she died, not in the shop. She went on a holiday to Miami, came back on a Saturday. She called me Sunday morning, said, I'm back from Miami visiting my daughter. I said, how was he? He said, I had a fantastic time. It was wonderful. I'll come to the shop tomorrow and tell you all about it. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Put the phone down. Sun uh, Monday morning, I got the message that she had passed away. She had a stroke. She used to smoke cigarettes all the time and she used to drink coffee as well. I remember Anne, uh, even as a young child, uh, uh, if I remember, she, she was uh, uh, quite a nervous smoker of cigarettes. I have a memory yes. of her smoking yes, very yes, quickly. <laughs> well, I'm still in touch with her daughters. I met uh, two of her daughters last year and Melanie, the youngest one, we used to work in the shop for a little while as well. Uh, so uh, we still kept in touch with the family. I think that says a lot about you, Dad. Uh, everyone feels like they're part of your family once they've been to Davidoff and worked there. Um, you know, I would like to to ask you a, another tender question. Uh, I think of the people who've worked with us th that I know, I think we've lost four of them over the years. Uh, one was Anne Rickard, you yeah. mentioned. Of course, Dougie, Douglas Elliott, Douglas Elliott bless um, him. Bob Mays, who was our accountant for many, yes, many years, his father. and of course, Bob Osborne, who, who most recently passed away. Um, uh, rather than ask you to speak about them all, I have a very interesting question. What do you think they are smoking in heaven? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, Bob Mays used to smoke cigarettes. Yeah, I think it was Rothman's, possibly. He used to sit, smoke cigarettes in his office. If you uh, went into his office, the walls would get yellow. Every couple of years, we had to paint them. And I said, tell them, Bob, it's not good for you. He said, no, no, it's all right. 
Uh, Dougie, he smoked occasional cigar. He smoked possibly Romeo Juliet he would smoke, maybe a Hoya de Monterey. He, I think he did like the Monte Cristos as well. He was an everyday smoker, but occasionally he would light up a cigar and enjoy it. He was a lovely man, Dougie. Of course, Doug, Dougie was, what, 82 when uh, he stopped working with us? When he started working with no, us. No, stopped. Uh, no, no, well, he stopped working. It was uh, 2011. It was November 2012. He he was still working, and then one day he didn't come to work. He was doing like three days a week by that time, and then he didn't come to work. This is very unusual. Then the next day I had a phone call, and Margaret, his wife, said, you know, he's not well. He won't be coming in for a few days. And I said, well, let me talk to Dougie, and we had a chat. I said, how are you? He said, I'm good. I'm good. I'll be there next week. I said, well, don't worry. Don't rush. Although it's Christmas, don't you worry at all. We have enough staff so for you not to worry. Next week, I said, but let me know how you are. Next week, he called said, Edward, I, I'm still not feeling well. I can't come. My legs are not carrying me any longer. I said, you know what, Dougie? Don't worry. We're nearly approaching Christmas. Have the whole month off until Christmas. And what we will do after Christmas, I will ask one of our uh, taxi friends, Dave, who lives near his house, to pick you up once a week. He, he will drive you, bring you to the shop. You will be there for a few hours. You could sit there and instead of you getting up and serving the customers, the customers will come to you. You will uh, chat to them because people lost. He had some, his own range of old customers who love talking to him. And then he said, are you sure? I said, I'm positive. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. And a few chats we had around Christmas for New Year. And then his situation got worse. He was in hospital. And I think it was 12th of January or something around that date, 2012, he passed away. With uh, Bob Mays, it, it happened fairly quickly. And with Bob Osborne, as you know, Bob Osborne, he had nobody. He had no relatives, no friends, nothing. Uh, his life was his work and arsenal. And I think Cornwall, he had a, I think he, he had a had, fondness for St. Ives. He had like a love that. of St. Ives. In the earlier years, he used to get onto the train or the bus and he would go there. Uh, there was a, like a bench, he would sit there and watch the scenery. Uh, a matter of fact, uh, when he died, his ashes, the boys from the shop, that's where they scattered. Maybe there's a few of the ashes still left on that bench there. <laughs> but uh, I have to give credit to the boys in the shop, uh, all of them, but in particular, it was Paul, Ian and Joe. Uh, they adopted him, as, adopted him as their uncle. And they used to look after him, they used to take him food, they used to take him fruit when he was in the hospital. They used to arrange his affairs, I mean, everything, everything they arranged. They used to arrange the council to take care of uh, him whilst he was in the hospital, everything. Until the right day to the day when he died, and then Paul arranged for his funeral to be done on St. James's Church uh, in, down the road in German Street. And when the ceremony finished, his coffin, we all walked from the church all the way to the shop, all of us with the flowers. And then in front of the shop, the hearse stopped for a few minutes. And then from there on, they drove away. So uh, that was very touching uh, with Bob. That was beautiful. Uh, other than that, everybody else is healthy as far as I know, I hope. Knock on wood, and long may they be healthy. Nobody's been affected with the coronavirus, thank God, because they are all uh, either Immune. smokers <laughs> or even <laughs> <with> the nicotine. <laughs> well, I've just got two, two more short questions. Uh, I'm conscious we have another few minutes left. Um, in a few mm. sentences, what does a fine cigar mean to you? That's a difficult questioning. Well, that's why I'm your son. Difficult question and probably very easy. You know, a fine cigar is the one for me that gives me the most pleasure. 
and when I part with it, I end up with fond memories of that smoke. And in the future, it invites me to go back and have some more. That is a fine cigar. It's, it's a relationship. If there's a cigar you like and you go back to it, to me, that's a fine cigar. Regardless of who made it, where it was made, how it was made, it doesn't matter. If that cigar gives you satisfaction and pleasure, that is a fine cigar. Nothing else. It doesn't matter what's on the band. If it has a band or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's my opinion. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dad. And my last question, what advice would you give anyone starting their own retail business today? Mm. Assuming coronavirus ends. Well, to me, you cannot start any business. The doors you will not be allowed to open as we're sitting here talking. You know, we're uh, Friday, 29th uh, May 9th, uh, 2020. We're going through this. Uh, I'm saying this because this tape Sometime in the future, some people might watch it and not even remember these days or would have not been born. But uh, all the retail shops are closed. Everything is closed apart with the exception of some chemists and some supermarkets. Uh, nearly 30, 35, 36,000 people have died in the UK. Yesterday, over 100,000 people had died in the United States. Uh, same in Europe and China. And this coronavirus is spread out the whole of, all over the world. From every corner of the world, there's reports coming in. So there's nothing is open. However, on the brighter side, the government is saying that slowly they will allow the premises and shops to open. I hope that we should be able to open mid-June 2020. Uh, the pubs and restaurants will still not be open. Uh, and uh, but yeah, we're on the right track. So, what advice will I give? What advice will I give uh, to somebody opening a shop, regardless of all the problems I mentioned? Whatever you do, whichever shop you open, it's important that you, the prop proprietor, to be there. It makes all the difference. You have to be there. You have to look after your customers, do to them as you would expect to be done if you were in their place. With that formula, you cannot go wrong. Having said all that, of course, events of the world, you never know what is waiting for you tomorrow. However, you have to take that risk. You have to jump into the water. And once you're in the water, you might as well swim. That's my advice. Thank you, Dad. That's wonderful yeah. advice. Uh, I think it's a very opportune moment for me mm. on this auspicious day to offer you a toast for not just 40 years of wonderful cigar retail, but for being an amazing father, for being an amazing boss. Uh, I think I speak for mom to say an amazing husband. And of course, on behalf of Carolyn and your grandchildren, uh, a unique grandfather, Thank you, Eddie. Long may you live another 40 years of this business, I hope. And thank you for everything. Oh, thank you. Happy 40th anniversary, It's Dad. a pleasure and a privilege to be Greta's husband, your father, and, and Caroline's father, and the grandfather to the lovely children.